have a location or a site that is hydrologically functional, meaning there's an on-site cycle. Water falls there, water stays there, water is recharged there. Instead of um, being used up there, so you're running your sprinklers all day long, that water is not staying right on your site. Most of it is being evaporated or running down your street and ending up in your storm drain. That's not helping your garden, your lawn, or, or anything else. So on this little sketch, we have lots of examples. Obviously, this person had a lot of bit of land to deal with, um, which is fortunate for them, but they were able to install a couple rain gardens. So there's um, lots of native planting there, um, lots of um, infiltration happening there. Their soils have been amended to encourage infiltration. Um, they have uh, a swale right in front of their yard, so there's not pooling happening during big storms. And instead of it running down the street into storm drains, it's able to collect there in that grassy area. Um, so this is, you know, this is just the sketch, but it is the the ideal scenario for for a, a greenscape, so to speak. And what could that look like for you? Or what are your, your options? And we'll start to get into that. Um, so a lot of us have lawns or grassy areas in front of our house or maybe in our backyard. And how can we use those areas more sustainably? Um, and how can we um, incorporate systems into that, into that lawn as opposed to just the grassy space? Um, what are the plants that we're using in our gardens and lawns and how can those choices be made more consciously um, to support the, the native habitats um, and also the, the water cycle on site? What are our structural options, whether it's in our yard or in our community? What are things that we can advocate for? Um, and what services could those provide for us and for our water systems? And Maggie, I'm just going to call up a, a question from the chat. Um, just sure. since we were talking about stormwater, um, yeah. Deborah is asking, what about um, boating waste to discharge? Um, I'm assuming for the Salem Sound Coast Watch. Um, are you uh, wondering about like how boats discharge their waste? Um, I think possibly um, asking, wondering safety. how much of that is contributing to the Salem Sound's pollution. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think maybe Deborah, you and I should should privately chat about that. I um, just because it's a, a little off topic, something that I I can definitely address. Um, in short, boats are not supposed to be discharging their waste in the harbor, um, and so if they are, obviously that would be contributing to our water quality issues. Um, there is some in harbor sampling that's happening. Um, not not by Salem Sound Coast Watch, um, though we are keeping our keeping an eye on it. It's not a scheduled sampling, as like our other projects are. But um, yeah, there are rules to to prevent that, and as long as they're followed, then we should be okay. Um, and DEP does some some in harbor sampling, as does our our local board of health. So um, yeah, so good zoom back over here to our again what our traditional landscape is and and how that can be used a little differently um so when we think of a traditional um lawn it's this short shortcut um green space not a lot of plants there um none in this example um so this grass, which is probably Kentucky blue grass, which we'll talk about a little bit later, um, is not native, uh, not native certainly to New England and is gonna require a lot more water than other grass varieties will. Um, it, this grass looks pretty short, it's probably cut very regularly, so there's not a lot of bug life, um, microbe life able to survive on that lawn. Um, it's in what we call an ecological dead zone. Um, so in addition to the fertilizer, I mean, to the water that we're having to use to sustain this crisp green lawn, we're also probably adding chemicals or fertilizer, or it came wrapped in that blue um, hydro boost seed. Um, so obviously 
things we can do a little bit differently there. And it's interesting to note about uh, grass, turf grass, is that it is actually the largest crop in North America <laughs> and it's useless. <laughs> it doesn't, it, it's not feeding anyone. It really is not contributing to making a more diverse habitat in the area where it's planted. Uh, it's very short root. So we spend a lot of money and uh, acreage uh, and water, certainly water on it in this country, but it's not really giving a whole heck of a lot back. So yes, yeah, so it's very common. Um, and it's a lot of the water consumption during those months uh, we talked about from May until September where we're getting very little rainfall, but that's when the sprinklers go on, that's when people start getting out in their lawns, and we want people to care for their outdoor spaces, of course, and it's fun, and you get to make your own little oasis, um, but there are ways to do that that don't uh, waste water and can actually help create more habitat and make our uh, areas even greener and more interesting for everyone to live in and more pleasant to live in. And you can see, you know, we, we lose all these native plants that should be growing around that the pollinators are used to and the birds are used to when we replace it with a monocrop. And uh, of course, a misconception is that when you're watering the lawn, while well, it's going into the ground, you're helping recharge the aquifer. But of course, that's not true. If you think about uh, just the other day when it was rainy, um, the conditions of a rainy day when we're getting natural precipitation are very different than your average day when someone's uh, watering your lawn. Not that I haven't seen lawn watering systems going during the rain, but <laughs> usually you see them during the sun. And of course, with that hot, hot heat from the sun, the water doesn't really last on the ground very long. It's a long, it's a very fine mist to begin with, very easily evaporates, goes back into the air. So it completely is taken out of the water system and not much of it even goes into the ground to help the grass. Uh, and frequent lawn watering will actually uh, make the roots quite short. Um, so abstaining from watering, even with Kentucky bluegrass, which is needy, to begin with and not native to Kentucky, surprise, surprise. <laughs> um, even those grasses, you can make a little bit more drought tolerant by not watering them as frequently and forcing them to develop those deeper roots. Or even better, you can replace your lawn uh, and there's so many reasons to do it. Um, so we have an uh, example landscape here where you have this flat of land I think it's much more interesting having uh, different textures, different heights to the plants. I can see there's a hibiscus there on the left that's just starting to bloom. So they'll have some nice summer blooms. Um, they have some native grasses that are giving it some texture. I'm not positive what the plant over to the right is, but it might be a azalea, maybe not. But Basically, you can create this much more interesting, different height, different texture, different smells, um, landscape that also will bloom year round if you plan it right. Uh, so much more exciting than a lawn. Uh, but if you do like to have some sort of turf, uh, because maybe your kids like to play soccer, or you just like to lie down on a blanket in the lawn, um, you can certainly do that. Uh, and we say fescue to the rescue. Fescue is a native Plant, uh, grass variety. There are actually a few different types of fescue. Uh, there are some that are so slow growing, you pretty much never have to mow them, which is awesome, <laughs> especially if you have a very steep area or a very large area. Um, they, there are varieties that are often used for athletic fields, so they're very tough. They can take a lot of wear and tear. Um, but the best thing about fescues is that they are native and they are drought tolerant, so you don't need to water them. You really don't have to um, pour a bunch of money and time on them, they'll do okay. And this is an example of another way to transform uh, whatever outdoor space you have. So obviously this is um, somewhere in the hunt, I think. Yes, in the hunt. <laughs> and you'll see it's got a gorgeous little garden area with all that variety we talked about before, but also has a little patio area. So it's uh, so this family can make use of the space in different ways. 
Uh, you could do the same thing if they wanted to have uh, this out front with a parking area. So these are permeable um, porous pavers. So although they're creating what seems to be a hard surface, it actually will let water go through those stones and get it into the groundwater. So you can still have these areas um, that we think of as impervious, but there are ways to use either permeable pavers or space um, impervious pavers apart enough so that water can travel between. Um, so you can have the best of both worlds. And here's a, another landscape much larger than the other one. Um, often there is concern with if you're on a waterway uh, blocking your view with vegetation, um, but this is trying to show that you can still access waterways and you can still have a great view while still keeping in that plant life that is not only creating habitat, but is also helping to stabilize the ground there uh, to help fight erosion. And then there's gray infrastructure. Yeah, so your other options, um, other than just replanting, which we'll go into um, the specifics of and do some plant suggestions in just a minute, um, but structurally, some of your options for um, water conservation or water reuse specifically are rain barrels and rain cisterns. So those um, structures, depending on how invested you want to get or how what your project budget is, um, these barrels or a number of barrels can collect the rainwater right from your downspout um, and can be saved for later irrigation use um, or um, to water your garden. Um, obviously not safe for um, ingestion, but I think you knew that. And then these cisterns also a little bit more robust of a um, uh, project, but can be can obviously conserve or hang on to a lot more water, um, which could be pumped directly into your irrigation system, whatever that may be, um, or can be um, slowly discharged back into the ground directly, um, again, as opposed to running off into our stormwater system. You can see that left-hand photo is, speaking of Nahant, our development director, Trish, and her daughter, Katie, installing their rain barrel. So we practice what we preach. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think Trish was with us um, at one point. Um, she might have had to scoot off, but um, yeah. And again, just mentioning those pavers again um, that uh, resident used. Um, these, uh, this picture on the right here is a more um, large scale application of those porous pavers. So um, again, can a project that if you don't have the budget for, maybe you can encourage your town to um, to advocate for, to look into um, during, you know, a new development project. So that rainwater goes right back into the ground in that parking lot instead of, instead of running off, causing pools and the ramps, et cetera. We've all driven through them. Um, so this material is made out of similar, um, similar material to regular asphalt, but is just graded differently. So those smaller pieces aren't able to fill the pores between the, the larger stones and water can run right, right through them. Um, the picture on the left is a little bit of a different application where there's actually um, turf or moss growing in between those pores. Um, also a great, maybe more um, patio friendly or toddler friendly application is the the planted pavers there on the left. <clears throat> well, I'm seeing some questions, which we will get to um, at the end, but yeah, they're noted. Um, uh, but I will say I definitely do recommend planting a yard with different varieties of plants. You'll see behind me, this is my childhood lawn <laughs> that has many, many clover and violets and <laughs> dandelions growing in it. It looks beautiful every spring, so very proud to have it up there. Um, and it takes no effort from us. <laughs> it doesn't need us. Yeah, and I think that that kind of covers the, the question before it, um, that these, these alternatives look expensive. Um, and the idea is, you know, to totally repave your driveway or to install a patio of porous pavers. Yeah, not, not cheap. 
um, but to replant with something that would naturally grow there like clover or violets, um, obviously a, a much cheaper option. Um, and if you were already going to develop a patio or, or install a patio on your, your porch or your backyard rather, um, that's kind of what the thinking is here. And some people are fortunate enough to, to be able to spring for a repaved driveway. And so we hope that they're getting these messages as well. Um, so other green infrastructure, and once again, yes, a green roof is an investment, um, but they're very cool. They're a great option for um, businesses, especially businesses that because of whatever they're, they're doing it for their industry, they take up a lot of space uh, with impervious roofs. Um, they're a really great option. They're beautiful. Uh, there are a few options around. You can see uh, Ipswich has one on the Whipple House. Um, uh, Riverbend, our headquarters for the Ipswich River Watershed Association has one. Ours is a little different because it's on a slope. Uh, it's more of a demonstration garden, but it survived the 2016 drought without ever being watered. So they do really great. Sedums are amazing. Uh, and there's also one at the Pembroke Elementary School in Georgetown, they have a big green roof. Um, and I believe there are more than that, but those are some examples. Uh, there are usually a variety of different sedums, uh, which are amazing plants. Uh, they grow in deserts, on mountains, uh, pretty much everywhere. Everywhere you go, you can probably find some variety of sedum. Uh, so there's a lot of textural diversity in them. They do bloom. Um, so they're very interesting. They don't need a lot of work from you. Um, you do have to make sure that the structure that will have the green roof can take the weight because, of course, when it absorbs rainwater, it will get quite heavy, um, but otherwise dry out. Uh, but they're very interesting and some, certainly something that we can look into as we continue to develop towns and cities, um, trying to make it the default to include this green infrastructure. Uh, and more green infrastructure would be things like swales. Uh, so these are just areas that allow the water to go somewhere. Um, and, I, and I have to say, not just uh, for letting the water travel do I like having areas that are flat pavement going into vegetated area rather than a curb, uh, but if you are a fan of turtles, <laughs> like I am, uh, then you worry whenever you see those raised curbs that some poor little turtle is going to get to it trying to go from one area to another and they're not going to be able to get over that ledge and they're going to walk along the road until they can find somewhere to go and then they get run over and I worry about them. So these areas not only are a better way to let water move through our uh, communities, but they're also not creating an unnecessary impediment to wildlife. Uh, we, do we really need curb? No, not really. And it looks nice. <laughs> so uh, here's another way of getting water moving across impervious surfaces into recharge areas. Um, so the treatment train. So the water is flowing off of these driveways. It's being led down these grass swales down into bioretention cells, um, which I'm guessing are rain gardens in this case. Are you? Are these rain gardens, Maggie? Uh, yes, um, yep. or something like it. Yep. Um, I think this one you could see the this one and and the next picture as well. You can see the um, cap, that plastic piece in the middle there. So there's some sort of retention tank beneath it. Um, so it's not just it's not just that above surface garden. Um, there's some structural thing happening under under the ground mm -hmm. there as well. And that's probably, that looks like a cul-de-sac possibly. So very likely that's um, capturing the um, runoff from that cul-de-sac. So it's dealing with quite a bit. Whereas if you're just getting a swale for your driveway, you won't necessarily have to deal with that sort of uh, amount of runoff. So here's another look at another bioretention and gravel swale. Um, so if you have a property that abuts a road, especially if it's on a slope, you probably know it's really hard to grow plants on an area where that water is constantly quickly running over. Uh, so gravel swales can be really useful for that, um, for directing water away off of the road and into these recharge areas. Uh, and having these things also is providing all these other um, inputs for the area. Not, 
like I mentioned before, we're not creating unnecessary impediments for wildlife. Um, we're making it somewhere that's going to be much more pleasant to walk and drive down as well. You're not going to see standing areas of water where you're driving towards and you see another car driving towards you and think, which one of us isn't going to be able to see because of the huge wave of water that just washed over our car. Uh, if you're walking down the street, you're not walking through huge puddles as much. The water is somewhere to go and it's going in the ground where it's going to get a lot cleaner than if this were just going to run downhill until it found a road crossing where it could go into a tributary or the river. And you can see examples of some of these LID projects that we've been showing on our website. So if you go to the greenscapes.org website, you can use our LID tool uh, and it'll show you where around the, uh, the state there are uh, green and gray infrastructure projects that you can go see how they're dealing with stormwater and um, minimizing their water use. Um, yeah, I know that that map screenshot is not um, not beautifully represented um, in the PowerPoint here. So definitely check it out on our website. Um, there is an option to to add to this viewer. Um, we wanted to to make this a, a tool to show that low impact development is is a uh, um, achievable goal in your community and it can be easily incorporated into any sort of development project or retrofit project. Um, and you as community members really do have the voice to 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 make that important in, in your town. So um, we do encourage you to advocate for it whenever you can. Be the change. I'm sorry, I had to. <laughs> uh, so yeah, greenscapes are not just about your own space, but um, shifting the norms around what our gardens and yards should be. Uh, and you can maybe be the first one on your street. Um, maybe everyone on your street does this. That's awesome. Sounds like a cool street. Sounds like all the cool people <laughs> live there. Uh, and you can also help bring those projects into your community. So whether you're um, involved with schools or a business or something like that, really uh, being the first one to say, I think that we, if we're going to do anything, should do it the right way and make our community more beautiful and more sustainable. Um, and that's something we're really considering right now, uh, especially with Ipswich River, uh, development is really increasing on the North Shore. So making sure that when we do develop, when we do create these new places, we're keeping water in mind. Uh, because as I talked about before, the Ipswich River is so important for providing the water for so many people. Um, and it's already stressed. Uh, so when we're getting more developments, we really can't ask the river to give more. It's giving a lot already. Uh, but we know that that's a lot. Um, you know, we towns still need to grow, new people still need to come in, we need to have new business. Uh, so we're looking at ways for communities to have water neutral growth. So still growing, still changing, but not impacting our water resources. So we actually have a net zero water use toolkit that we have developed, and we're working with towns to roll that out and really give them the tools and tips they need that will help them make their towns the most efficient water users and conservers uh, that they can. Mm -hmm.